How's it going? Good. Good morning, Jane. Good, Good morning. morning, Jane. <laughs> Hi, everybody. It's September 12th. I'm Jane Johnson with the Briar Hill Group at Remax Camosun, and I'm here and with. Hi, I'm Andrew Plank with Royal LePage. And Did you it's have a good September week? 12th, really, already. Wow. Huh. Okay. Did you have a good week? I did. Pretty good week. Yeah. So what, what are you finding is the uh, ha happening in real estate in Victoria? For me, I'm finding um, buyers are being a little finicky. I've got a number of buyers, uh, but I'm not hearing from them as much as I did. Um, the, definitely the urgency is down. So um, And waiting for the right property is up. Um, and then with, oh man, like, so had an offer recently on a listing and the buyer, the buyer on that offer, just, they made their offer. It was well off asking price. My client countered with what we thought was a reasonable counter offer, start the conversation. Buyer just disappeared. No further, no further comments or action. Um, the other agent was sort of surprised, but yeah, that just done. So, um, and I think, and you were saying something like you're, that's kind of what we're both sort of predicting and seeing more of people are just sort of saying, well, here's our offer, take it or leave it. Yeah. And I just want to say that, you know, we choose to work with buyers, buyers choose to work with us. Mm -hmm. And there really is a thing I, I, I do believe called integrity and um, just understand that you affect your agent's integrity if you write an offer and then you just go ghost them or go by the wayside. Um, and um, sellers will start demanding things like non-refundable deposits if this is what's going to happen mm. because uh, they want to, to know that the buyer's invested in the property. Well, I guess and sellers can maybe demand that but in a buyer's market they're going to have a hard time actually getting that across the table right so well, we had an offer multiple offer and it went sideways today mm. and um and in a multiple like, offer for sure yeah pardon in a multiple offer i can see that yeah i was yeah. like really anyway um but well, you know we are be really like it's so much different than it was um you know four or five six months ago where you know there was many, many, you know, unconditional offers and so forth. And now it's just completely the other side of the table for, for who is in control for, um, for negotiations. Yeah. I just want to say to buyers that these aren't the sellers from a year or two ago. So don't be angry at them. <laughs> don't you find? Well, I think that, you know, I was disappointed that there wasn't a continued conversation in this negotiation. And I think that buyers, um, don't, some people don't really have the wherewithal to just continue the conversation. That's what negotiations are. And I was really surprised that on just a single counter off, you know, did the buyers just expect my clients to cave, um, down to the, you know, quite a bit off the asking price and to different dates that they were looking for right on the first offer, right off the bat. Let's have a conversation about it. Let's see if we can find common ground. Maybe my clients would have accepted in the end. I don't know. A lower much lower price but the, we need to go through the process well the other thing is you are what i would call a collaborative agent as am i and so we want to um you know make things work out and we're going to be we'll chat with you and discuss you know the nuances of the offer but i do find that over the past two years especially newer agents have trained to be competitive agents they're less collegial and they need to relearn the art of the negotiation and get to getting to yes. I think that this is, um, I think it's important that realtors talk to and, and encourage and, and, and train their clients to understand the negotiation process and how you will be negotiating and what your intentions and priorities are and how things could go. But for, for, and this was a, a this, I was working with a very, you know, good agent um, who's, you know, well known in the industry, and 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 she was quite surprised that her clients just didn't come back to the table that evening or the next morning. Um, so, you know, sometimes our clients surprise us, but I do think there's an, a, a sense of entitlement right now, and I don't think it's actually in the buyer's best interests. No, and also if other people aren't buying, buy, buy. Now's a good time. 
-hmm. Okay, so um, we have lots to cover today. Mm -hmm. We are doing our market update for the end of August. We're going to go through that super quick. And then we have uh, Doug Dolan of our Dolan Construction. He's talking to us from Nanaimo. They're going to be uh, moving into the Victoria market. And he's interested in uh, discussing how they work with clients and um, what they do to get them from finding a property to like a piece of land to building yeah. their dream home. Yeah. And folks, if you have questions, be, be sure to chime in. If you're curious about the development process, um, the construction process, you know, chime in because Doug's here to answer your questions. Okay. So uh, comparing last week over this week, we mm -hmm. had 282 new listings. That's compared to 179 for the first week of September. Yeah. Pending were 87, and that's compared to 97. So overall, yeah. um, more listings coming on than pending. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the first week of September is just before um, the uh, Labor Day weekend. So we would have expected to see less listings coming live. A lot of people would have been pushing their listings to be after that long weekend. So I expect to see a bump in the new listings. What's interesting is the decrease in sales. We have more inventory and less sales, you know, more inventory to choose from in terms of new fresh listings, but we had, you know, 10 less sales. So that's a, an, an increase in price, an increase in price decreases. Right. Which is interesting to me. But so it's mm -hmm. just saying, you know, we've, we're now more established in September here and let's get the price on the market. So that is 200 over 200 price decreases in two weeks. So mm -hmm. uh, sellers take note. Okay, go ahead. And, and I should say too, we just had a bump in interest rates and that often causes another pause in the market as people kind of adjust to and try to understand what that could mean for them. So um, that also will put a bit of a pause. And I, I always find that that sort of pauses, causes a pause and then people get back to the business again afterwards. So I was comparing the beginning of the last two months, um, mm -hmm. the first week. So I just wanted to show you guys. So net unconditional sales for up to now in September is 131. In the first week of August, uh, it was 83. Mm -hmm. And um, September of 2021, they had 761 sales. So we are down year over year in terms of sales, but up month over month. Right. Yeah. So New listings and, at 384 for the past uh, or a month to date. And that's compared to 978 for the month of September. Yeah. And I'd say that's kind of on track. I mean, if we're September 12th, we're kind of a third, like a little over a third of the way into the month. And um, you can sort of triple this number. And we will be actually at that point above. Um, above the September 2021, if it falls, falls on, you know, continues that pace. So maybe at the end of this month, we'll see a thousand new listings plus or minus a hundred. Um, mm -hmm. Active listings are of course up over last year where we had 1,124 active listings on the market, but still 2,152 is still, I would consider low inventory in general. We're still low on or under the long-term average. For yeah, and actually it's people. remarkably consistent month over mm -hmm. month. Yeah. yeah. And year over year. Yeah. Okay. Total active listings for the past two years, we were at 2,600 in their first year of COVID, August, 2020. So uh, last year around August, we were just under 1,200 and now we're back up around 2,200. So we're on a recovery, mm -hmm. but you can see it's sloping down and that is more of a, um, a normal, I would say, curve. Yeah, and you can see the active listings in 2020 from, you know, September going in a downward curve from 2021 in September going in a downward curve. You know, we've reached August and we're going to have September and we can expect this curve to continue to go down. That's just the number of active listings. It's not, um, and it does relate to sales, of course, but it also relates to how many people are bringing their properties on market and how many properties are expiring and sold and not coming onto, onto market. So this number is this is where we'll see sort of more how these numbers are affected. This, this slide here, Jane, you want to take that? Yeah. So I remember two years ago when we were going through this hundred a thousand sales a month that we were just like, Oh my God, that's crazy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Last year we were at 800 
around 800 for August and September. And now we're down around uh, 500. This is more normal, I would say. Um, the ratio, you can see where the solid line is compared to the, the um, sorry, where the bars are compared to the line. You can see the right. ratio is below 50% here. And again, for folks, the bar the bars are the number of listings that have come on in that month. And the uh, line is the number of sales that happened in that month. Yeah. So okay. we're looking at an absorption rate of at least three months. That, okay. Yeah. It means if there were no more properties that came on market, we would take three months to sell off the current inventory. And I see that my little indicators on the right are off, but basically we're in a balanced market right now, heading into a buyer's market, my thought. Yes, balanced market in terms of what traditionally we would consider a balanced market. Um, and it can, the curve is equalizing. You can see that this curve is coming down to more, um, you know, every month it's the, the curve um, uh, angle has lessened. So we're almost at an even par here. So we'll probably move into balanced market. I think we've, because we've come down from a high so quickly, uh, we're still in some ways a buyer's market, I would say, uh, except for the fact that sellers are not really willing to negotiate like they used to. We are seeing those price reductions though. Yeah. They're not willing to negotiate on the, on the offer. <laughs> They're negotiating on the listing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Single family homes. So um, two well, years ago. Mean, sorry, that's a good point. So, what we're seeing is people are bringing their prices into adjustment. They're lowering their prices over time. But when someone brings an offer well off the asking price, they're still waiting to see where the market will actually lead to. And they're going to probably more be more likely to do price adjustments than the negotiating adjustments. That's a really good point. And that's something that we're kind of seeing. Well, I'm not just a pretty face, my darling. Thank you, baby. <laughs> okay. Um, the average price uh, two years ago was around a million. We were just talking to Doug about that. Mm -hmm. And uh, last year it, it uh, increased to 1.2, so up 20%. And now we have come down from a high of 1.45 in April to resting just over 1.25 again. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting to see this little bump. Um, but when, in the next few slides, we'll see... Um, something that we'll see. I think there's more volume of sales in condos. So it's a pretty, probably more indicative of what the market could be doing. Although condos and homes are a different market. So, and also just remember that this is representative of the whole market. So if you mm -hmm. want to know what's going on in your area, it's very area specific. So, and with a declining market, the way we have it right now, you're going to see the market um, compressing. Uh, from the outside in and from the upside down. Like I was mm -hmm. on Pender and um, I think we got like six showings in, whereas before when I've been up showing in the islands, we've only gotten like two or three. So, right. Yeah. Okay. So Take this is, a, yeah. So this again is the, the curve that I'm, I'm saying, you know, we're, we're seeing this downward curve in pricing from a high in January of 2022 of you know around six hundred and eighty thousand for uh, average price for condo. That's again all areas. So again, it's area specific for your home. But it's been coming slowly, slowly down in terms of price. And then there was more of a, a abrupt drop between June and July. Uh, and here we are in August, or you know we're looking at August stats, and it's again dropping. But this this curve is not necessarily showing. It's hard to say if this is really a steep. It's gonna how steep of a down curve we're gonna see here. I don't see this as, um, you know, hitting a cliff. Right. Okay. Um, road townhouses again. We always talk about the flip flop happening because of the quality of road townhouses and and what's selling where. Um, but we are looking at it re positioning itself to just under the $850,000 mark. And this is up over the past two years from around 650, just below 650. Um, and down from a high of 950 earlier this yeah. year. Yeah. So that's, so again, you know, it's quite a significant drop. Absolutely. From, from a high. And again, this also okay. suggests when we're saying, you know, now's the sellers, now's the time to sell and not to try to create like a, 
or you know an urgency and you know glut the market with properties up on on the market but if you're getting ahead if the market is truly on a downward slope and you can get ahead of that and you can sell even if you sell um for less than you could have back in april you will then be buying a little bit further on as well and if prices continue to go down you're going to actually have your money go further for your purchase so if you're looking to sell and then buy it's actually a good time for a uh for a seller to be selling right okay um i agree because also with interest rates you're going to see that that number is going to be harder to get if the interest rates go up again Right. Okay, so a home. Uh, we were talking about the validity of home pricing index. <laughs> it's right. based on a benchmark home. It's not a real home. But let's just look at percentage changes. <laughs> percentage so, changes in terms of increase in value in these various areas, and we already said that areas are. It's very area specific for your home, and this really illustrates it. Right. So North Saanich, oh. we're seeing an increase of fifteen point seven percent. That's year over year. And hmm. so what this says to me is uh, even though the, and we were just looking at that, even though the market has declined, it peaked in April, but we're still above where we were year over year. So we're in a good market guys. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, a year makes a big difference and um, we're still, we, we're definitely not, you know, to, to know that we haven't gone down below our last year prices. That's, that would be a number where we'd start to say, okay, we're really seeing a correction. But, you know, um, it, it's, I guess people start to think they've got money in the bank when they look at the value of their home. And you can't really rely on that. It's going to be what the market is at that time. And when we see, you know, properties have gone up by 20% in a year, there is the chance of volatility when we see that kind of big increase in price. We can expect there might be some, some modification later on. Um, but yeah, so North Saanich 15.7 uh, from an average of, you know, uh, from the uh, HPI stated value of 1.5284 down to 1.3207. Sorry, up from 1.3207 up to 1.5284. Apologies. And Sydney um, homes have gone from 945 to 1,071,000. That's mm. up 13.3%. And I think I, I I just want to say I think Sydney's a great value still for people. Um, nice little town, a lot of development there, um, and a lot of amenities. So it's been growing nicely. Central Saanich is also one of those shoulder districts that most people mm -hmm. drive through, and they aren't really aware of. It's beautiful, especially Saanich Ten is very cute. So August uh, twenty twenty one the. HPI was at uh, 10.52 and now it's at 12.36, so up 17.5%. But there has been more new construction in that area. There's some nice village areas, you know, San Ocean Village, Brentwood Bay. Um, if you're looking for, you know, a village to live live nearby, and uh, the commute's actually not as much necessarily as the West Shore. Okay, so. Next slide, um, Saanich East, this is the, the biggest area. It's uh, HPI was at 1214 last year and now it's up at 1418, so up 16.8%. Right, now we've got Saanich West. It's sort of um, in between the two highways, I like to sort of say, uh, the, the Pat Bay and the uh, Trans-Canada Highway that goes up island. So uh, Saanich West is a little bit further from town in some ways, uh, tends, prices tend to be a little lower than in the core but um, we can see an increase of 15.8%. That's from an average, uh, it's from the HPI in August of 2021 of 986,000, going up to 1,142,000 1, in August of 2022. Yeah, and View Royal, again, another um, uh, shoulder district between the core and the West Shore. So we're up 12.5% to just over 1,000,000, 1 1.106 from just under nine. Mm -hmm. And another area where I feel like, you know, that's a great little area to consider, um, not always on people's radar, but has some nice water, nice views, uh, some amenities, it's a growing center, and it's in between two growing centers. So when you think about that, it's going to, it can't help but do well in terms of property values in future. Um, Esquimalt, 15.9%, um, Esquimalt's done well 
And uh, that's from an average of 900, sorry, an HPI of 918,000 in August of 2021 to 1,064,000 in August 2022. Okay. And then I just have a seller panicking right now. <laughs> Somebody's trying to reach you, eh? That's always fun. Hey, I'm busy. <laughs> Texting me. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. So VicWest, um, price uh, 903 August 2021. Again, another great area. It's up over a million 24, up 13.4%. Uh, Victoria is up 14.4% to 1312. And Oak Bay has ooh, gone from 1.6 to 1.898, so up 15%. Oak Bay really is jumping. Yeah. yeah. Well, again, another this is another great area for builders because they've um, there's a lot of houses that haven't been well maintained, so they're mm -hmm. going for a lot value, and then you can or subdividing yeah. into smaller lots. Lots so when we were looking at those percentages before, we were seeing you know thirteen percent, twelve percent, eighteen. You know, now we're seeing eighteen percent and fifteen percent. Now we're seeing, yeah. Thank you. So 15, 12, 15, 16. Now in the West, in the West Shore, though, we've got some numbers that are more in the 24, you know, 24 percent yeah. range. So quite a bigger, much bigger jump in price price difference here. Yep. So Colwood and Langford are up 24 and 22 percent, both to 1.1. And 1.15 million, respectively. Mm -hmm. Langford or um, chosen has gone up to 1.38. That's up 24.2 percent, and that's because there's not a lot for sale in Machosen. Mm -hmm. um, the land values increased, and Suk and the Highlands are up 18.3 percent, and the Highlands mm -hmm. up 15.2. And I will say, I was looking in the Highlands. It was very hard to find a property there. I was going to say, you know, Highlands won't have many sales and it doesn't have as much amenities near it unless you're right on the border of, of Langford there. So it's, um, I can see why Souk, which has been really um, developing, is going to have a higher percentage of a rise in value because it's still more of a center. It's got more amenities around it. It's got the ocean right there. Uh, so of course, Souk is going to go up more quickly than the Highlands. Interesting to see Machosen going up that quickly. Well, it's because like a, I would say a year and a half ago, you couldn't get anything under a million, but now mm. it's, yeah. that's not the case. Yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, we're going to move on to our guest speaker, who's Doug Dolan. I just want to say um, as well that we're on every Monday morning at 10 a.m. So please join us. We're on Facebook and um, YouTube. So Doug, come on in. How's it going? Hey, good. Thanks for having me. Thanks for meeting us, Doug. So how long is this is a family company, right? Yeah. Yeah. My dad's been doing this for about 35 years. So quite some time. Mm. And I've been involved uh, more or less for about, I'd say 13 to 15 years. I had a couple of different things that I tackled when in my younger years and, uh, but uh, the last three or four years have been, uh, yeah, hard at it. And you're based out of Nanaimo, but you're working, you know, majority of the island. Um, you mentioned that you've wor you've worked as, as far um, south as the Malahat, but you would you would be you are looking at moving into the Victoria neighbor area as well. Yeah, correct. So yeah. Uh, we've done all the way up to Campbell River. Mm -hmm. um, and as uh, far south as the Malahat currently, like you said. And uh, yeah, we're interested in taking a look at some Victoria homes in the custom market. Um, yeah, I go there quite a bit. You guys got uh, really good food. So I end up there all the time and I, I look at places like Oak Bay and uh, such and I see a big opportunity there. Um, mm -hmm. Build some nice houses and whether that's spec opportunities where you come in and we uh, build something out and then put it to market or if that's just customer first, uh, which is typically what we do, customer first situation, uh, and build someone a custom home, you know, specifically tailored to them. Right. Yeah. Okay. So let's, um, well, you might want to um, work with this slides. Tell us about your company. Yeah, sure. So like I said, uh, 35 years, uh, my dad's been doing custom homes. I joined them 15 years ago. Uh, you know, my dad, uh, to curate it, make it simple, has always uh, been, a, been a big proponent of uh, 
you know, doing what you say and uh, keeping things, um, I wouldn't say simple, but, you know, he's a big believer. If it wouldn't work over a handshake, it just doesn't work. You know, uh, we always try our best to uh, pick clients that we believe uh, are going to work well with us too. You know, it's, it goes back and forth. It's, they do their due diligence on us, but we also like to do our due diligence on those that we work with. Uh, the custom space is so, uh, it's, it's so personalized and there's just a lot of back and forth that it's not a great space to, to, um, you know, pick a bad customer or a bad builder. It's, you're going to spend a lot of time with each other. Mm -hmm. So that's always been very important to us. And obviously I learned that from him. So he's passed that down to me and we continue to do so. So yeah, it, trust is super important to us and, and setting it up so that these people feel safe, right? It's a, it's a really big investment. Uh, I believe the numbers stand that most people a custom home is the biggest investment they're going to make in their life. So um, you got to handle that with, you know, appropriately because it, it, people are nervous and there's, you know, there's bad experiences out there that people hear about from other custom uh, builders out there. And so you're, you know, you're trying to make people feel safe essentially. Um, um, so I just actually, let's just go to the slide about, um, hold on about this one. So like, I find that there are certain people who like to build, uh, new homes and there are other people who like to have, uh, you know, like regular, would you call that a spec home? No, you wouldn't call that a spec home. You do you mean like, um, cu customer second, something that we list yeah. and someone buys? I do, I do call it a spec home, technically. Mm -hmm. uh, I think spec sometimes makes it, there's like a, a bad rap with spec, but I call it, you could call it a custom spec. I think sometimes that's what people are calling them nowadays. It's, it's a, you know, it's a high quality home, yet uh, no one had input except like an interior designer and ourself, and then hopefully someone likes it and buys it. Right. I and sometimes they, depending on when they get in, they can make decisions, right? Yeah, I mean, the earlier someone engages us, the more likely that there's room to change without, you know, uh, too much detriment to the timeline. But at the right. same time, if we were in an agreement, it's up to them, right? We're, you know, that's the whole thing is we've done some spec homes um, up in Parksville as of recently, and we're still doing some. And generally, we've always been customer first. So it's not uncommon for us to start to go back to our roots and, and want to help people along and, and, and build out exactly what they want. As long as obviously you're just not past that phase. Right. Um, Reaching yeah. the point where you've bought supplies or um, you, you know, there's additional cost to do it, um, you know, more um, interior design or whatever. And obviously if you're starting to move walls and things, then you're getting into a com more complete redesign and more custom. So absolutely, um, there are definitely builders here where, the, you know, let's say they're doing a row of townhouses and they will say, you know, you've got two color schemes to choose from. Uh, if you come too late, you just get the color scheme we chose. And uh, that's the extent of your, um, of your options. Um, yeah. We're not going to make any difference here. Um, whereas there's other builders who you get in early enough, like you said, and you can make some choices and changes, but it does increase the cost a lot. To make yeah, it can, kind of right? I mean, at the end of the day, uh, we're here to serve the customer. And if mm -hmm. the customer has the financial capacity to go backwards, we would go backwards too, you know? Or, right. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's more about, does it make sense financially for them? Uh, you know, and we do our best to just give them advice that, yeah, we give our professional opinion, but at the, at the end of the day, if, if it's how they'd like to do it, we're, we're happy to do so, right? So. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And that's that comes back to what you were saying at the beginning, um, where, you know, understanding and getting a good communication strategy with your client, getting, you know, being able to sort of do the handshake, but also understand what their needs are. Um, you know, you'll meet people where uh, you're both speaking and you can you can have a great conversation, but you're not understanding each other. Yes. And both both parties are great people, but they just don't speak the same language, and um, and it's just not productive to go forward together. And there's other times where there's just a difference in sort of morals or agreements. So, yeah, it's really well, important to establish that right off the bat. The I, I've worked with new construction, and the um, biggest thing I find is when you get the additions to the contract, and then the buyer isn't thinking about the cost. And so you, you need to do an amendment to your contract so that they're fully aware right from the beginning. Like, yes, if you go from uh, laminate countertops to granite countertops, it's going to cost you 
X amount of dollars. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Yeah, scope no. having gone through a renovation uh, a couple of times, you know, scope creep is very real. And the idea of, you know, well, if we only just do this, if we only just do this, this would be so much better. And then you uh, you just really add to your costs. And of course, when you're dealing with a new construction, it's really important for the, the the builder to keep some sort of container on the conversation. Because as you said, you know, if 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 the if if the client has unlimited funds and resources then of course anything's possible but on, without that you know you don't want to have surprises no no and one of the things that's changing and and one of the reasons i've been uh looking to talk with more people like yourselves and and get out there is i believe it's getting tough for people because we've pushed the price so close to the ceiling of people some people spending mm -hmm. that you there's no room for creep on price there is no there's no space so like the communication between mortgage brokers and the communication between realtors and such is going to have to get, uh, you know, more clear because one example, just recently we had a, uh, had an individual client reach out to me and had some questions about our capacity to build the, uh, the house that he put in front of me. Mm -hmm. And at the time he had an end date uh, as to a fixed interest rate. And so at the time he was probably close to his max square footage based on the estimated price we had, uh, to be able to afford that, that said house. Well, the communication and the things needed to be put together to get it back in front of appraiser on time so that he could hit it. Well, it turns out we didn't hit that deadline based on, uh, well, it was, it was probably too tight to begin with, but there was just a certain amount of appraisers busy and or not completely invested in the process and so then we came back to the table at the new uh, interest rate that had i think we had maybe another three or four weeks of that fixed interest rate and because of a couple more hiccups on their end and and on the mortgage broker side of things it got squeezed one more time and so i think when we first met this guy he had a 2800 square foot idea and by the time we were done with those hiccups and the lack of communication, we ended up, uh, he would have been sub 2000. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's a tough hit for people to take. So that's a significantly different home. Yeah. And it changes, it changes really everything. And, yeah. um, so I think it's important now, um, for that communication to be very strong. And half of what I'm hoping people will take from this is that the earlier you reach out to a contractor and start the process, uh, cause, and a lot of this process usually is more soft. It's, it's, it's not necessarily going to cost anyone money. It's just the beginning of the conversation is my hope is that we can point people in the right direction earlier because mm -hmm. the alternative is you do it. The alter you go the other way and you end up speaking to a mortgage broker and such first, which in some cases, I think that maybe they need to be at least at the very first time or part of me at the very same time. It doesn't be yeah. first. But if you leave me out of the conversation, I might not be able to let you know that, by the way, plans are going to be three weeks, which means the appraisal's got a two-week delay, which is five weeks. So if they had a four-week four, four week deadline, I, they would have known they'd miss it if they talked to me first. Yeah. Or, or so. so it's just something to consider now because, again, uh, prices have went up significantly, as you know. And I would assume a lot of people have passed their ceilings of borrowing power. Yeah. And it's no fun to go out and design a house that you're instantly going to have to go back and redesign. And it's no. really from, it doesn't really make it any easier for us. It's no fun to let people down. And it also is, it's really just money they didn't necessarily need to spend. A conversation could have solved that. So this is a, this is a lot of analogies between that. And, um, you know, when we meet a new client, we have a conversation with them and um, try to determine their needs. And then again, in a shifting uh, rate environment that also, there's a lot of conversation about shifting their needs as well. Yes, but also getting them talking to the right people right right off the bat, and people often leave it too late. You know, they're ready to buy, but they haven't done. If they'd come and talk to somebody even six months, even a year before they were planning to, just start gather a little bit of information, not have a deep, deep conversation. It just get a, no, just get a little bit of an idea of where you could go from here. What what are the what are the key things they need to be aware of? Yeah, it does doesn't need to be a very long conversation. Honestly, it's one of those things that. Again, it's more of a phone call mm -hmm. uh, and, and it can be super casual and it can end up turning into more than that, obviously. But it's just, I think in some cases, I feel that contractors have been put uh, 
later in the process than possibly needed, uh, especially now. It might have been one thing when they were guaranteed uh, the opportunity to afford something just based on the prices weren't so crazy and so close to their top of their budget. But now, but now that we're right there, it essentially becomes more important to touch base now because yeah. at the very least we might even be able to give you a, a ballpark uh, cost per square foot. And you can even do a little bit of your own math, you know, on the back of a napkin and get an idea if you could even afford it. And then, then you can at least take that back to your mortgage broker and have those questions answered. Mm-hmm. And, you know, either instantly know that it's time to redesign your house, or at least you just don't go, uh, uh, you know, multiple miles in one direction and have to come backwards, right? It's what, I, what I'm finding now is a lot of um, people go to homes, go to a series of homes that a builder's building. They yes. find the builder there. They kind of fall into a relationship with them. Mm-hmm. And then they end up... Um, uh, deciding to build with them in that development. And so then they do their changes. So it's, (laughs) it's very rare for a buyer to have the vision. I find to Mm -hmm. be able to look at a lot and see what kind of house can be built on it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, we can be helpful with that too. Like, uh, I've put it out there to people and I will continue to, is, uh, if you have us out, um, even to be there with your realtor and take a walk, it, we could help make the, we, we want to make sure it works for you ideally, but at the same time, I think where the value we can bring in the alternative direction is help you figure out your no earlier. So it's, you know, we can bring even our designer, like we work closely with the designer so he could come and give you a little bit of an idea right away. Uh, one of the other things that we bring to the table is our connections with surveyors, geotechs you know our environmental people and our ability to call on them early in the process even just for casual walks of a site uh, that just puts you in a position that less and less surprises are likely like one of the thing that one of the things pardon me that we're seeing more often now uh, and it can be super unfortunate is because we're customer first there's a lot of cases where they've already purchased land yeah. and so they have it in their mind you know they they've checked out the municipality and they're assuming based on those wait times, they'll be starting their house at X time. And we get pulled into the picture. Obviously they've already made the purchase and it turns out that there's some sort of stream or a tree or, you know, just something on an environmental side of things or on a geotechnical side of things that is going to cause a major delay, right? Like uh, one specific case recently, uh, we came across a client who we're continuing to work with. It's just obviously taking longer now. And, uh, they have a property that had something that you wouldn't call a stream, but it's a stream, you know, right. by those standards. And now uh, that has to go uphill, um, I believe, into the provincial government and be reviewed. Um, and so now it's probably instead of just a three to four month building permit, there's a development permit that may take almost as long. So you could. And there's a, Doug, there's probably a chance that this, you know, in some cases that wouldn't even be approved, you know, a tree that can't be moved or a, a stream that just they won't approve a building, you know, within the repairing area. Yeah. So we, uh, we have here um, pros and cons. So Doug talks about knowing the costs and fixed pricing, um, differentiation and branding. So you're having your house stand out from your neighbors. Uh, having a tailored product so that would allow you to to really determine all your fit and finish for the products um, the the binding contract is interesting to me um, so once you've you've set it out that you said you're gonna buy this home you do have a binding contract I and then we've lost uh, Doug I hope he's able to get back in yep. Yeah. Um, so let oh, me just bring this. the slides back up. Thank you. There we go. Um, and then, um, the cons are, of course, we've all heard about the supply chain mm-hmm. and that, and the increased costs as well. Yeah. And then what he was talking about, you know, the zoning, what does the zoning allow the setbacks? from the property lines, what could you actually build on this property? And if you're not, if you're not consulting, I mean, we as realtors um, are not experts in 
um, development, and you may have a realtor who is more uh, does a lot more development than others, but you're still not going to find that they are. Um, you still need to go to your true expert, just like you don't go to your realtor for mortgage broker advice and so forth, we uh, or or building inspection advice. So, bringing in a developer, making an offer subject to um, inspection, and maybe during that inspection, you bring your bring your uh, builder in to to review this stuff and give you a, a sense of what actually can be built on this property. Yeah. And so just, you know, maybe your dream home isn't going to fit because of the slope of the land or whatever. I mean, I've, mm -hmm. I've, I've been in a few houses where we've expected to, the floor plan has expected to have um, a lower level. And so where there would be a staircase, there's just this open area and people come in and they don't know what that area is for. It's really, it's mm -hmm. really interesting to see. So let's just talk about the pros and cons here. Um, um sorry frequently asked questions oh, here's Doug. could you go back uh back one slide though hey, yeah sorry guys I'm not hi sure Doug. That. yeah sometimes that just happens um we were just going through pros and cons uh without you there yeah um, um development costs we were on development costs. i think you skipped over this and i just want to say um development costs there's a lot of people who don't understand that there's additional costs that the municipality might require if you're um, if you're building a home. Yeah. Like, yes. Sorry. Yeah. So you can have. Um, I'm not sure what they're calling it in Victoria at the moment. We got we call ours DCCs or right. in some cases I've heard CACs or yeah. So amenity contributions, um, depending on what phase or how much of a reno or if you're subdividing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, depending on that, will obviously depend or uh, create. Um, you know, the cost that you're going to incur. I know like, for example, a new, a new lot is sometimes approximately at least up in the Nanaimo area, about 17,000 or 17,5. So those are just costs for people to consider if they're doing a subdivision. Uh, usually you don't really incur any of those on a renovation side of things from a single family perspective. So you're safe there. Um, but yeah, it depends on what phase they're at. You know, if they already have that property with a home or if, uh, they're in a, re, uh, a new subdivision, but the development costs uh, don't come into play too, too much on the uh, custom home side of things typically. Um, but yeah, it is something to consider. And the other cost before I, I cut out there um, is some of those costs might be phase one if they need to check into the property and make sure there's no environmental issues. Those things are worth considering. Um, just even the consultants, that's another part of the conversation that we can have is we might look at the property and instantly know approximately that there's about to be a $10,000 bill coming down the, uh, down the pipe, right? Uh, just based on that specific property might have, uh, some clear geotechnical issues. And those are just things that people might not expect. Right. And it, it helps to get it in early because the earlier it's in, we do that the more likely it can be uh, a part of their mortgage as well right it can be a part of the contracting which means they just might not need to come up with it as cash it can be more something that at least that helps service those consultants so great so i just wanted to go on to the um frequent questions how long does the design and permitting process take sure yeah so typically design it's it's so customer dependent because some people are going to pick faster than others right and some people want more and more custom but a, a reasonable range with design is going to be somewhere between three to six weeks once you've engaged with our uh, designer and and then after that everyone's happy typically what happens is we move to an estimate uh, before we go to the permitting phase um, and that estimation can take somewhere in the realm of two to four weeks tops. And the reason it can go past the two weeks is sometimes when people get that initial estimate back and they take a peek at it, they realize that there's certain costs in there that are either too much or just unnecessary for them. And so that we can go back and we might have to relook at a design in some cases or just uh, take a look at the specs inside the home. You know, they might decide, hey, you know, this $8 a square foot flooring budget is unnecessary for us. Why don't we go to six? And so the reason that's why I'm using those ranges is honestly, it can be quite fast if someone knows exactly what they want and already has plans. Um, 
But at the end of the day, uh, you're looking at, like I said, three to six weeks with a design, with our designer, pardon me, uh, and then two to four for the estimation process and the signing of a contract. And as soon as we sign the contract, typically at that point, we move right into permitting. Uh, the permitting will depend on which municipality you're in. Um, I'm not savvy to Victoria's timeline right now, but I'm assuming it's probably similar to some of ours. I'm, I'm going to guess probably, I would say no less than eight weeks. I was going to assume, I don't know if you guys are aware. Depends uh, where you are. Like there are 13 different municipalities. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. it can be very long or very short. And I do find that, that builders tend to, um, get comfortable in different municipalities and then they know who to contact and all of that. So up Island here, it's not uncommon for us. Uh, Parksville is quite quick. Uh, so they're looking sometimes between about two to four weeks. Uh, Nanaimo is not too bad either. Nanaimo generally has been squeezing people in under eight weeks. Um, and then we have the RDN there, the regional district has been taking a little while. Um, and that's been somewhere in the realm of eight to 16 weeks wait times at the moment uh, and definitely usually over eight. And uh, so that gives you a bit of an idea. And, you know, I don't see unless I'm just not, um, I, c I could be wrong, but anything over three to four months is usually pretty unlikely on the island here. I don't know if you guys see anything longer than that in those municipalities down there. But it, it depends on um, what they find on the lot. Like, um yeah. If they find a midden, I know that in one case, these people bought a, a lot. They weren't my clients, but it's now for sale. And I went to the lot and I was like, okay, now I know why they're selling again, because I think geolo geologically there's important stuff there. Um, I have a question. Um, so with, they're talking, one of your questions you have here is about buying your own material and hiring sub trades. And my thought is the answer would be no, because you guys are controlling the cost of the, the build. Absolutely. So, I mean, there's, there's a gray area there. And the reason I brought it up is it's so, it's so common to get asked that early on. And so, I mean, there's, there's a few reasons why it leans towards no. I mean, one of them is we still are responsible for the end result in, you know, there's delegating a little bit of the process doesn't take away the fact that we're responsible for the whole process. Uh, we still have to answer to new home warranty regulations and, and, and proper procedures. So at the end of the day, us taking the wheel on everything is more ideal for us. Um, so that's, that's generally one of them. And then also just for the customer's personal interest as well as in some cases it, it affects timelines depending on who they get it from, right? We already have loyalties in a lot of cases and good relationships with these vendors. So going to your best friend who also sells stuff doesn't always end up being a better result for the customer either. And the trouble is, is sometimes you think you're saving money, but are you, if you're losing time, you're not saving money at the end of the day. Right. Yeah. Uh, so that, yeah, I would lean towards no, there are, there are gray areas, but yeah, let's, let's stick closer to no. So, and that just speaks to the um, custom, does a custom home table take longer? Well, no, if you are working with your crews that you know are going to work a certain way, but if you're working with different crews, then it will take longer because you're going to have hiccups as, because you, you're accustomed to their rhythm, right? Of course. And so if you were to uh, measure the timeline of a custom home compared to obviously a house that's already ready and for sale. Yeah, it's, it's slower, but at the end of the day, if you show up and there's a piece of dirt and you know, there's another piece of dirt, they're both vacant. If we do it well, there's really no reason why a custom is going to take longer per se, but half the reason in some cases it does is because it's, it's specifically the cust It's a customer controlled process. We go as fast as we can, but we're also there for you. Because in a lot of cases, the custom market, they're not in the same hurry, right? You know, they're, they want to move forward, but they've also been thinking about that house for 5, 10, 15 years. You know, it's not uncommon for us to be building someone's, you know, last home or second to last home in their life. And, and then, so they've thought it, they've really thought it through, right? They already have some ideas and they're super excited about it. So the process, yeah, it, it, that's where you could arguably be longer, but if it was, 
someone that was knew exactly what they want and wanted it to be quite hands off. We, we build just as fast as anybody or faster, right? Um, it's yeah. So it's, it's really customer dependent at that point. So isn't there a saying uh, good, fast, Andrew, you were um, muted. There's a saying good, fast or accurate, right? You can't have all three. So no, um, no not usually. I do have a question. Um, how do you handle couples? <laughs> Let's be like counseling. <laughs> yeah, it can be. Yeah, no, it's interesting. Uh, you definitely every once in a while are going to have some differing opinions, and uh, you know you take on uh, more roles than just being a carpenter. I could put it to you that way. Yeah. Um, but yeah, people are generally pretty good about it. I, I'm sure there's some husbands sleeping on couches after meetings. <laughs> uh, so. I try and stay out of it the best I can. Yeah. Uh, can, can, you guys, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. It was for some reason it was um, not letting. I was. I. I felt like Jane kept interrupting me because I kept trying to say things. <laughs> I was getting talked over. Now I understand why because Jane, we, we usually have pretty good. Um, I forget what the question currently is. Um, oh yeah. That, so, you know, when working with people who are, um, you know, the custom buyers. They may have some things, I guess, that um, that from a resale perspective may be unreasonable. Um, and obviously, it's their home; it's their choice. But do you ever go into any kind of conversation around? You know, this is you're making a home that will probably be, um, you know, not not really fitting the grain for other folks. We do have that conversation sometimes. I mean, what's interesting about it in a lot of cases cases part of me because they're it's their last home or their second to last home with some people they don't care. Uh, they're less interested in that you know it's not about resale at that point uh you know so there's a level of we want it and that's how we want it um but yes we do interject sometimes and let people know just with some really uh from the side advice hey you realize that this fourth bedroom may not be worth your you know the extra amount of money uh, but I guess usually that would all be hashed out when we're getting an idea for their goals, right? Specifically, right. Uh, yeah. you know, if someone comes to us, let's say a 32 to 35 year old couple, it's more likely that conversation is relevant. Right. So, you Absolutely. know, it's because they want a custom house, but it's nothing. It's clearly not a forever. That's when that conversation is more likely to happen. Whereas if a, an older couple comes to us between, you know, say 60, 65, and they make it very clear it's their last house. Yeah, yeah, it's it's less likely that it's a problem. So. But let's just um, talk about the warranty you guys offer. So it's the regular warranty of two, five, and ten, correct? Yes, yes. So, so how do you recommend people? Like what I've, I always tell people is put the diary and put it in your diary that you have a two-year warranty on almost everything in the house. And um, like, do you ask people eighteen months in? Hey, start looking for nail pops and stuff. Yeah, we like to keep the communication open, right? And make sure that people realize they can reach out to us for this reason uh, or those reasons, pardon me. Um, usually the dialogue is quite strong for a couple months after for those reasons. Like every once in a while, if something's going to butt its head, that's when those things happen fairly early, right? Or after the first summer, if anything mm -hmm. like that's going to happen, usually that's when it would happen. Um Honestly, typically, like I, I'm a little bit spoiled. Uh, my dad's built really nice houses, so I don't. I actually don't see a lot of warranty work, to be honest. Obviously, we're still available like anybody else to do so. It's just not something that's super common for us to have to go do uh, outside of maybe a, a hiccup on, on a something to do with an appliance that may cause a small amount of uh, damage that we have to go take a peek at. But, um, you know, I know I'm sure everyone says that, right? They have no issues, but generally... Uh, I haven't had to become super familiar with the new home warranty structures only yeah. for that reason. So, and, and folks, for for anyone curious about this, you know that generally this new home warranty is is held by a third party. So, they they expect the builder to come back and do warranty work. But if the builder is no longer around, there are other options available. The warranty still is in place. And yes. I do suggest that you do do your research on your builder to see how long they've been in business and whether or not there's a reputation out there for them actually following up and doing the home warranty issue. I know with some uh, condo buildings, um, there's been some fights actually. 
litigation. Around warranty. Yeah, getting, you know, is this under warranty? Is it not? And so forth. So tell yeah. us about your uh, future plans here. Sure, sure. Yeah, so uh, we are going to stay in the single family space. We, we enjoy building custom homes. Uh, I think Vancouver Island is going to be a fantastic place to build homes for quite a, to uh, quite a time to come. Um, uh, we are looking at other opportunities uh, on the multifamily or commercial basis. So if anyone's looking for a builder, those are some things that we are interested in. Um, and we are currently um, working on some small developments as well. Uh, mostly in the single family space. So, uh, you know, if you look to us or keep an eye on our Instagram page uh, in the next six to eight months, there should be some opportunities for people that are looking for uh, a lot or more than one lot, you know, depending on who they are. Uh, and then down the road, we are interested also um, in uh, either partnering with or acquiring uh, construction businesses or things related to construction. Uh, I believe one of the things that will be um, a good way to differentiate yourself in the future slash create a better customer, um, uh, a better process for the customer will to be uh, control some of these other facets of the industry, you know, um, just yeah. based on where I think most of the things that have went wrong in or not so much wrong. It, it's a natural thing, right? Is one entity has their own interests and the other entity has their own interests, right? Um, but of bringing those home and under the same roof. So over time, uh, you know, someone can come to us and in the same breath, they're designing their house and, you know, just down the hall, they're also securing the finance for that house. I think that could, you know, it's, it's like the, it's like a model, like a, a Google model, right? They, they mm -hmm. all those great acquisitions have only made life easier for people and, and brought down costs. So I see that as a potentially, uh, a smart way to help serve the customer in the future, right? And whether that's just very strong partnerships with the other aspects up or down the supply chain or sideways with other contractors, um, just as things get more expensive and uh, the supply of, like, I mean, I'm sure you guys are seeing it in one way or another is there's, there's a lack of people too, uh, you know, as far as labor, labor right? So how, how can we, how can we better serve our customers in the future is going to be a lot about, I think, cleaning up these communication channels and, and making people realize that it's in their other part or part of me, other uh, parts of the industry, realizing it's also in their best interest to work closely. You know, no. uh, a lot of the headaches that I think everyone's getting are mostly just based on, you know, Friday hits and, and everyone kind of forgets about it. But at the end of the day, next week still has to come. And, um, the, the first people to fix those problems will honestly, I think, have a, a pull and, and see more and more customers come their way because I notice with the customers now, especially those that are a little tighter and closer to their budget, especially as the ceiling keeps moving, they're really stressed out and they, and they almost don't know what to do about it. And I don't really blame them because at that point, they're almost having to try and pull together the trades or part of me, not the trades. They're trying to pull together multiple industries to make it work. And I, I believe that, yeah, I believe that needs to fall on us more and more as the people in this space is solve more and more issues for them in one space. As, and, as the space know. gets more complicated, you need to have that that person in your in your in your corner who can really help you with through it. And it's really hard for anyone to do it all themselves. We're running out of time here, Doug. But I just want to really briefly you mentioned earlier cost of construction. Maybe you could give a, a, a quick. Um, you know, custom spec kind of what's the cost of construction currently that people can sort of expect to. Sure. Sure. Um, so yeah, these are just reasonable ranges um, in the new construction space right now. It's not uncommon to see between three and $400 per square foot. Obviously uh, ranchers are usually more expensive per square foot just because you have less economies of scale but technically they still might not be more expensive. They just per square foot, you should be ready for that. Okay. Um, we have seen it go over those prices uh, and slightly under, but it's not very common lately to go under, uh, but it's a good range. Someone should at least when they're thinking of what they want, keep in mind that if it doesn't make sense at those numbers, uh, that there's more, more due diligence to do. Um, renovations, it's not uncommon currently to see between 150 and $300 a square foot. Uh, $150 a square foot is going to be a lot closer to very simple flooring change, maybe some baseboards some paint. Uh, and then getting closer to 300 and possibly plus is going to be getting into 
when you're getting closer to down to the studs, right? You, you've tore it all out. Um, nice. Additions are very similar to new construction. Uh, they can be slightly more expensive only because to get the house to a place that it's ready to take on that new square footage, there's some labor in the opposite direction first. So, so really an addition is just new construction with some of that labor typically. Um, and then demolition or keeping an eye on hazardous materials uh, seems to be about a 30000 to about $75,000 hit, uh, depending on the size of the home. So just I think when we first got into the business, I think when we first got into the business 15, 16 years ago now, um, yeah. the cost to demolish a home was around 10, 15 grand. And yeah. that was everything. But now you're telling me up to 75. Now that seems to be when you get in a, a super hairy house that has things, uh, you know, kind of the pre 1990s. Oh, sorry. Um, th yeah. So that was, I just reached out to a hazardous materials uh, consultant and someone that does the whole process and said, you got to give me a bit of a range here. Uh, and he said confidently that that's, that's a good range and over 75 is unlikely. It's mm -hmm. just helpful for people to realize that if they're walking into a house that clearly looks like it's in rough shape, that if we have to tear it down for you, there's just a chance that that needs to be considered uh, a you're price. You're better off buying vacant land in that case than a home that's already been built. That's right. So, yeah. Hey, yeah. Doug, how do people get in touch with you? Yeah, so we have our <laughs> website there. Oh, thank you. You brought it up for me. Uh, so we got our website, ardolanconstruction.ca. And uh, you could email me or uh, give me a call uh, at the phone number there, 250-716-6928. Um, even on Instagram, uh, our Instagram is just at our Dolan construction uh, it's worth a peek. Uh, we got some projects on there that you can look at, uh, and yeah, yeah, we're happy to hear from people and I definitely want people to realize that it's the first calls free, right? Uh, uh, take a shot and, uh, give us a call as I think that we can, uh, we can be quite helpful, right. And, uh, maybe save you some pain in the future. And you're looking at moving into Victoria. Yeah, yeah, we're happy to look at opportunities down in Vic. And uh, for anyone that's north of Vic, uh, we're happy to look at those as well. Uh, as far as, mm -hmm. like I said, uh, it's not that we wouldn't go above Camel River. It just starts to become a bit of a stretch. Um, and, and likely at that point, just maybe more expensive than someone's going to want to pay for to get you all the way up north. So, yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much for coming. Um, just stay on the line. I'm just going to, we're just going to summarize, but we'll be, we'll be back with you in a bit. All right, you guys, um, Andrew, uh, thank you again. How do we get in touch with you? Always a pleasure. Thanks, Jane. So, um, you can reach me, uh, give me a call or text at 250-360-6106, uh, email info at andrewplank.com or uh, check out the website, andrewplank.com. And as Doug said, you know, phone call is free. Feel free to reach out. And he's on Instagram as Plank Andrew, right? Correct, yes. Okay, I did I did put that in here and I forgot to update it. So I am saving it right now. Hold on. <laughs> Pardon? There you go. All okay. right, and if you want to reach me, my name is Jane Johnson. I'm with the Briar Hill Group at Remax Camosun. You can reach me at briarhillgroup at gmail.com. You can visit my website at briarhillgroup.com or at vancouverislandtime.com. And I am on Instagram at Realty Teacher Remax Victoria or Vancouver Island Luxury Living. Okay, and don't forget, we're here every Monday, so we need to subscribe. Yep, don't miss, <laughs> don't miss an episode. Make sure you subscribe. And if okay. you have something you want us to discuss, like contact Andrew or myself, and we'll be happy to put you on. We're interested in interviewing builders, um, Inspectors. Well, anyone, anyone industry related, or if you've got something to say that you can connect to what we do here, we'd love to hear about it. Yeah. Okay. So we'll see you, Andrew. We'll see you next Monday. I'm away for the next two weeks right. and then um, we'll be back in October, all of us together. All right. Okay. See you and uh, what you said we we're bringing Doug. Oh, we're, we're going to talk after. Gotcha. Okay. Great. Thanks everybody. Thanks. Bye. Bye.